Welcome to the neurology section. You are going to love neurology with Conrad Fisher because it works according to principle. It works according to principle as Ralph Waldo Emerson in Self-Reliance says, the only real satisfaction in life comes from the triumph of principle. I'm not sure if that's true. It sounds really good. I don't think Emerson probably got out that much if he said that, but at least intellectually speaking, the real satisfaction in life comes from the triumph, the principle, and neurology works according to principles. You'll also like neurology because it's very concrete. Stroke, CT first, always. Stroke, MRI, best, always. Acute stroke, heparin, never. Guillain-Barre, or as some of you say, Jillian Barr, Guillain-Barre. Steroids, never. Intravenous immunoglobulins or plasmapheresis, always. You like neurology because it fits according to principles like that. So the first thing is that when you have a stroke, all strokes, all acute CBAs, whether you call it cerebrovascular accident or stroke, doesn't really matter. And here's the point about this is that when you have leg weakness, my leg is weak, my leg is weak, my leg is weak, you have cognitive dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction, personality, cognitive, personality, cognitive dysfunction, psychiatric problems, and your leg is weak, your leg is weak, I want to kick you, I want to kick you, I want to kick you, I can't kick you, so instead I urinate on you, and incontinence, what is that? What is that when you have leg weakness, cognitive dysfunction, incontinence? Well, no matter what it is, best initial test is CT scan. Most accurate test is an MRI. If you come in the first three hours, thrombolytics, up to four and a half hours in some people. Stroke removal, clot removal, up to six hours with a catheter. Removal, not angioplasty. You have a person who has light-sided weakness, right-sided weakness of the face weak, of the arm weak, of the leg weak, and has speech deficits. What is it? Middle cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery. CT first, always. MRI first, best, always. In the first three to four and a half hours, thrombolytics. Catheter removing that clot from your brain up to six hours. After three or four and a half hours, aspirin. Always, always. You like that? Heparin, never. Leg, lower extremity weakness greater than upper extremity weakness. Cognitive and personality disorder, incontinence this is the anterior cerebral the anterior cerebral the anterior cerebral artery the anterior cerebral artery head ct first mri best thrombolytics in the first three and four and a half hours after that you can use a catheter to remove the clot aspirin you're already on aspirin, switch to clopidogrel, add dipritamol. Middle cerebral artery stroke, hey, where is this left middle cerebral artery? This is the left middle cerebral artery. Now what else will go with that? Hey, what else will go with that? My right arm is weak, my right leg is weak, my right face is weak. What'll go with that sparing of the forehead? Middle cerebral artery spares the forehead. It spares the forehead because remember, the neural innervation to the top of your head is bilateral. You got both sides. Both sides. If it's both upper and lower face, upper and lower face, upper and lower face, that's a facial palsy. Upper and lower face, if it doesn't spare the forehead, that's a facial palsy. Facial nerve palsy. Left middle cerebral artery stroke. What else goes with this? Right-sided weakness of the face, the arm, the leg. Speech. Now, speech is controlled by the left side of the brain in 90% of the population. Are you left or right-handed? Are you left or right-handed? If you're right-handed, your speech center is controlled by the left side of the brain 90% of the time. If you're left-handed, your speech center is controlled by the right side of the brain most of the time. It doesn't always fit, 
but handedness and speech centers do have some correlation. Not always, not always, but does have a significant correlation. But what else will go with this? What else? Let's see. What does a pronator drift tell you? Pronator drift. Mm -hmm. Pronator drift. Mm -hmm. That I can do the Macarena. Stroke now. CT. A C V A. So pronator drift. Mm -hmm. Most people think it means like a Romberg. It means cerebellar. But it doesn't mean cerebellar. Pronator drift is a sign of motor weakness. Pronator drift is a sign of motor weakness. When you have motor weakness, you pronate more. Pronate, supinate. How do you know it's supinate? Supinate. Give me some soup in the bottom of my hand. Give me some soup. I'm soup and eating. <laughs> Supinators. Now, which are stronger, pronators or supinators? Well, ladies, if you go to slap your man, which is stronger, a supinated slap? Or a pronated slap. Supinated slap, pronated slap. Which is stronger? A pronated strap is stronger. A pronated slap is stronger. That's right. By the way, you're going to be wrong in the next one. Conrad Fisher's world. Welcome to the most common wrong answer. Which are stronger? Extensors or flexors? Extensors or flexors? Which is stronger? And the answer is extensors are stronger. Extensors, not flexors. People think it's flexors, but it's not. Extensors are stronger. That's why when we seize, we seize like this. You seize extending. You seize an extension. Extensors are stronger. So pronator drift, it would also go with a pronator drift on the light hand side. Pronated drift. And what else goes with that? Visual fields. Visual field problems. What would go with that is visual field problems. Because if this is the visual fields, and you're looking at the right side of the world and the left side of the world, I'm looking out like this. I'm looking out like this. The right side of the world gets perceived by the left side of the brain. The right side of the world gets perceived by the left side of the brain. So what would happen if somebody had that stroke is that they would lose the right visual field. They would lose the right visual field. If we're looking forward, if you're looking forward like I'm looking forward like this, you would lose the right visual field. That's called a homonymous, same side, hemi, half, a, without, opsia, vision. Homonymous, same side, hemi, half, a, without, anopsia. Homonymous, hemi, anopsia. Homonymous, same side, hemi, a, anopsia. Half of the visual field. Now, the person with the visual field cut doesn't know that they're missing it. So they don't say, I don't see the right side of the world. This is what they look like. You're looking at them, and you think that they're looking straight at you, and they're like that. You're looking over here. And you say to people, why aren't you looking at us straight forward? I am looking straight forward. No, you're looking at the left. No, I'm looking straight forward. Hello, hello, don't you see us over here? Over where? Over here. I'm looking straight forward, I don't know what you're talking about. The person with the visual field cut does not know it. They think that they're looking straight forward. So here I am looking to my left, that's my left hand. The person with the homonymous hemianopsia doesn't know that they're missing half their visual field. It's like politics. Everybody thinks they're a centrist. Hmm. How can you not pay attention to those people on the left? Who? The poor people? I don't pay attention. To them. I just don't see them. Hmm. And the others go, how can you not pay attention to the rich people? You mean the people on the right? No, I just don't see them. Everybody thinks they're a centrist. But you just don't see them. You don't see them. It's like body odor. It, insight is only gained from other people. So homonymous hemianopsia, the patient doesn't see it. Short answer, the eyes look towards the side of the lesion. The eyes deviate to the side of the lesion. The eyes look towards the side of the lesion. The eyes deviate to the side of the lesion. I will now act out all of the neurological deficits. Let's do Kluver Busey. Okay, I will look towards the side of the lesion. That's how you tell homonymous hemianopsia. It crosses to the left. Now, very easy answers here. We have CT scan is the best initial test and 
15% are hemorrhagic, they bleed, and we don't know what to do with these people. They are screwed, they're intercoursed, they're coitused. We don't have anything to do for those people. You can't dig down into the blood and go and get rid of the blood. You don't do surgical decompression of hemorrhagic strokes. Surgical decompression is for subdurals and epidurals. Surgical decompression is for subdurals and epidurals. Surgical decompression is not for things that is blood buried deep, deep, deep into the brain. It's not for blood that's buried deep, deep, deep into the brain. Cause cutting through brain down to that collection of blood deep and remote into the brain tissue destroys the brain. You're supposed to be like, dig, dig, dig. Hmm, what's this? Oh, 1987. Dig, 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 dig. Oh, what's that piece? Oh, I think that's his relationship with his mother. Gone. Dig, dig, dig. No, you'll end up destroying normal brain. So you can't get out. Doesn't that sound unsatisfying? You keep thinking we should be able to do something more, but we can't, not for hemorrhagic strokes. How long does it take for a hemorrhagic stroke to become visible? Hemorrhagic stroke on a CT scan is instant. Hemorrhagic stroke on a CT, hemorrhagic stroke, or hemorrhagic stroke on a CT scan is instantaneous. Now, non-hemorrhagic strokes, ischemic strokes, embolic strokes, ischemic and embolic strokes need four to five days to reach 95% sensitivity on a CT scan. Now the MRI is much more accurate. The MRI will only need 12 to 24 hours to become visible and the MRA, magnetic resonance angiography, magnetic resonance angiography becomes visible essentially instantly within the hour two hours, maybe three, but it becomes visible within less than two to three hours, almost instantly, with perfusion and diffusion weighting scanning within the hour. So the MRA could show it, but it doesn't really matter for treatment because what matters more than the scan is, are the symptoms resolving? I had a patient today that had extensive strokes and his symptoms kept resolving. So the indication for thrombolytics was not the scan. The indication for the thrombolytics is are the symptoms resolving? The point of giving thrombolytics, the point of giving thrombolytics, because remember, less than three, three to four and a half hours, thrombolytics after three and a half, four and a half hours, three to 4.5 hours, you have an aspirin. Now you can also do a catheter removal, catheter removal of the clot, but the indication for these things is the neurologic symptoms, not the scan. The neurologic symptoms, not the scan. So here's the answers on the diagnostic testing. Now, you're going to like neurology because it's very concrete. CT first, always. MRI best, always. Under th three hours, four and a half hours. And I'm sorry I keep saying three and four and a half. It's because thrombolytics are FDA approved in everybody for under three hours. Many people uh, can get up to four and a half hours, not if they're very old above 75 and 80, which is a lot of people have strokes, not if people have other underlying illnesses, some people with diabetes, it makes them bleed. So they're not gonna ask you, they're not gonna play a game with you and say three hours and 40 minutes. They're either gonna make it under three hours or over four and a half hours. Now. Over four and a half hours, this is something new that many of you are never going to have heard of. Catheter removal of clots has become the standard of care, a potential standard of care, to get in there with a catheter and actually yank the clot out for the small number of people that actually have access to this sort of facility. For instance, here we're, t we're talking to you from New York City. Now in New York City, there are half a dozen places that do this. You can be in entire states that don't do it anywhere but catheter retrieval of clots or your four hour drive away, you're intercoursed. 
So catheter removal of clots is a standard of care. They, if it's going to be the answer, it's going to be super clear. That's going to say it's after four hours and it's outside the range for thrombolytics and they have worsening neurologic deficits and they put catheter removal of clot, you say yes. Now, is it removal or is it angioplasty? And the answer is it's removal because angioplasty to squish flat a clot, to squish flat the clot is an absolute no in the brain. Absolute no in the brain because in the brain, angioplasty and stenting is no good. It ruptures things. Angioplasty and stent the heart because hearts don't rupture. Huh. Rumi says, my heart is so small. How can this great love be inside of me? And Rumi Molavi says, look at your eyes. They are small, but they see enormous things. So the heart doesn't rupture as much. The brain is delicate. The brain is delicate. So that's why in the heart, heparin good. In the brain, heparin no good. In the heart, angioplasty good. In the brain, angioplasty no good. Remove the clot whole. Now, if you are a person who's already on aspirin, if you're already on aspirin, you could either add dipyridamol or you can switch to clopidogrel. Now, you might think that that seems like a small distinction. Add or switch. Add or switch. But it's not a small distinction at all. It's an enormous distinction because in the heart, adding dipyridamol is worthless, not strong enough. In the brain, it's good. In the heart, adding clopidogrel is good because the hearts don't bleed. But in the brain, adding clopidogrel causes bleeding. Genius point, genius point. A person comes in and he's got a stroke and he's also had an MI. I, I did this today in a patient, a mid left anterior descending and the mid left anterior descending lesion, the guy got stented. Now stents need both aspirin and a second antiplatelet drug. Stents need aspirin and prasugrel, aspirin and clopidogrel, aspirin and ticagrelor. Which one wins, the stroke or the MI? In other words, for the stroke, which should we give one or should we do both because of the heart? Which one wins, the stroke or the heart? And the one that wins is the more dangerous one. What wins? The MI, because it's the most deadly. So what wins is the most dangerous one. That's what wins. So the answer is you give both because you need it for the heart. You give both because you need it for the heart. Now, inside the brain, generally, if it's just a stroke, if you're on aspirin, you either add dipyridamol or you switch to clopidogrel. And the question of adding or switching is very important because in the heart, not good enough, in the brain, it is. The diagnostic evaluation of people with strokes. Everybody should have a Holter, 24 hour telemetry, 24 hour EKG, 24 hour EKG telemetry, 24 hour EKG telemetry, because if they have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, the person needs to be on long-term anticoagulation. Dabigatran, rivaroxaban, Edoxaban, Apixaban. Warfarin has more bleeding and less efficacy. If you have AFib on a Holter, you automatically have a CHADS of two. Rivaroxaban, Dabigatran, Apixaban. Warfarin has less efficacy and more bleeding. And you have to do INR monitoring. Next, if the person has a clot in their heart, you need to anticoagulate. Next, if the carotids show what percentage stenosis? You go to surgery, 
70 to 99%. 70 to 99% stenosis, you go to surgery. 70 to 99%. Here's two questions for you. Number one, what do you do about asymptomatic carotid stenosis? Person has carotid stenosis, but they've got no symptoms of stroke. What do you do about asymptomatic carotid stenosis? Nothing. What do you do about asymptomatic? You've got a person who's got carotid stenosis, but they've got no symptoms. Do nothing. We don't know what to do about asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Carotid and arterectomy kills people. And it's hard for people to understand this. This is not just like, you know, changing your socks here, you know? You're getting your neck cut and in the wrong way. There's a very, very harsh cut. And the other part about carotids, angioplasty does not work well for carotids. Stenting does not work well for the carotids. We think it should, it should have. Stenting and carotid, renal artery stenosis, good. Peripheral vascular disease, angioplasty and stenting. Coronary disease, angioplasty, stenting. But in the carotids, it just never worked out. So if it's asymptomatic, I want you to get this clear because you're gonna be seeing some of your attendings and reading certain things. It's not gonna be clear. If it's asymptomatic carotid stenosis, don't do anything about it. Symptoms in 70, symptoms in 70, symptoms in 70, and symptoms in 70%. Now, why not 100% is because if you're at 100% stenosis, you have learned to live without your carotids. For instance, do you think I worry about my hair? I don't worry about my hair. Matter of fact, it's freaking convenient. I don't worry about my hair because when you're at 100% loss, you don't worry about it that much. I don't worry about it at all. So, no treatment for asymptomatic carotid stenosis, no treatment for 100% stenosis. Everybody gets a halter to find out if they've got AFib, a flutter, echo to see if they've got a clot, carotid dopplers. You ready? They repeat the MRI, echo, carotid dopplers. There you go. Now, the other things as treatments that everybody should get, everybody with a non-hemorrhagic stroke should get a statin. Everybody with a non-hemorrhagic stroke, everybody with a non-hemorrhagic stroke should get a statin. Everybody with a non, 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 non hemorrhagic stroke, everybody with a non-hemorrhagic stroke should get a statin. Next, if someone is young, under 40 or 50, Young means less than 40, 50. Young, less than 40, 50, has a stroke. Why are 30-year-olds having strokes? 25-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 35-year-olds should not be having strokes. Why are you having a stroke under the age of 40? There's something wrong here. Why are you having a stroke at this early age? And the answer is, are you having vasculitis? Let's get a sedimentation rate. Why are a young person having a stroke? 27 having a stroke, 30 having a stroke? You shouldn't be having a stroke at the age of 30. Maybe you've got autoimmune disease like lupus. Maybe you're having neurosyphilis. Maybe you're having a hypercoagulable state, okay? And you maybe you have factor V Leiden mutation. When should you go chasing? Sed rate, ANA, VDR, L, RPR for neurosyphilis? when you're a young person who's having a stroke. People in their 30s and 40s and younger should not be having strokes. Maybe in your 40s if you're someone who's been diabetic since you're 20. Maybe in your 40s if you're a diabetic hypertensive. You know we have morbid obesity in 16 year olds now. So there are the diabetic 16 year olds from type two diabetes, can you imagine? And you've been diabetic for 20 years in your 30s. So if you have a person who's got long-standing hypertension and diabetes, they could have a stroke in their 40s if they've been diabetic and hypertensive since their 20s. But a person without diabetes, without hypertension, without hyperlipidemia, you shouldn't be having a stroke in your 40s. Vasculitis and hypercoagulable states. Vasculitis and hypercoagulable states. Final stroke subject. The final stroke subject is you have a person who's got dizzy, 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 lightheaded. Dizzy, 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 loss of consciousness. Dizzy, 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 dizzy. Where do you have to have a stroke to have a loss of consciousness? 
Where in the brain do you have to have a stroke to have loss of consciousness? We do all these CTs when people have syncope, but where in the brain causes a stroke that makes you lose consciousness? And the answer is in the brain stem. Dizzy, 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 dysarthria. Inability to speak. Dysarthria is controlled by cranial nerves nine and ten. Dizzy, 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 dysphagia. Dizzy, 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 dysphagia. Can't swallow. 9, 10, 12. 9, 10, 12. Dizzy, 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 diplopia. Double vision. Diplopia. Cranial nerves 3, 4, 6. Dizzy, 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 dizzy. Loss of consciousness. Loss of consciousness. Dysarthria. Dysphagia. Diplopia. Also, how do you get bilateral findings bilateral findings the only place to have a stroke that causes you to have bilateral findings has to be the posterior circulation the posterior circulation what's the other name for posterior circulation is vertebral and basilar, the posterior circulation. The only way to really image the posterior circulation is with an MRI. The posterior circulation is also known as the vertebral artery, basilar artery, the vertebral artery, basilar artery, the vertebral artery, basilar artery, the posterior circulation. Dizzy, loss of consciousness. Do you know that there's no place to lose consciousness by stroking up here? There's nothing in the middle cerebral or the anterior cerebral. There's nothing in the middle or the anterior cerebral that can make you lose consciousness. This is something very hard. Now, I want you to be able to go farther than I did when I was a medical student. When I was a third and fourth year medical student, I didn't know what the features of posterior circulation strokes were. I was so lost in neuroanatomy, people were talking about posterior and cerebellar, anterior inferior cerebellar, pica and fica and schmica, dica. I mean, kaika, waika, baika, laika. I mean, all, I, I mean, I, I just mostly closed the book and said, I think I'll punt on this one and study cardiology twice. But you're supposed to be better than I was at my stage of training. Not better than me now, because it's hard to do that. It takes a long time. It takes 15 years to make a Conrad Fisher. It makes a long time. I'm not really efficient. I'm mostly, um, uh, you know, entertainment. Uh, so, but the thing is, is that it's not efficient to make me. The, the way to do it now is to look stuff up. But if you look this up and you say, well, you know what? Do you think you can handle these three words for anterior cerebral artery stroke? Anterior cerebral artery stroke, leg weakness greater than arm weakness, urinary incontinence, personality dysfunction, CT first, MRI best, thrombolytics in the first three to four and a half hours, aspirin if you're after the first three and a four and a half hours, may use clot removal with a catheter. Um, if you have a stroke while on aspirin, we add diprotamol, switch to clopidogrel, uh, heparin is never useful. Look at the echo. Look at the echo for a clot. Look at the Holter monitor, the 24-hour ambulatory EKG to see if they need rivaroxaban, dabigatran, apixaban, edoxaban. Um, look at the carotids and do surgery if the person is at 70 to 99%. Don't treat asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And if you're at 100% carotid stenosis, forget about it. So what's the only thing? Do you have room in your brain for three words? I think you do. I think you have room for three words. And you can be better than I was because I did not learn anterior cerebral artery stroke. I did not learn posterior because I hated the neuroanatomy. It was taught by people who knew too much. You have the advantage of me being superficial. <laughs> Dizzy, dysarthria, dysphagia, diplopia, and the only place with bilateral findings and loss of consciousness. Posterior vertebral basilar. The diagnostic tests of looking at an echo, 24-hour Holter, are the same. Thrombolytics in the first three and four and a half hours. Catheter removal, maybe up to six hours. If you're already on an aspirin, switch to diprotamol, switch to clopidogrel, add diprotamol, it's the same. So I think you can do this, and you'll be better than I was.
who has gone far, for I would go farther. Now, in the next section, I'm going to start off the next section with a little test of what I said about stroke now. Let's see if you can remember. Don't treat asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Carotid endarterectomy is a very, very invasive procedure. And if your vascular surgeon is not doing hundreds of them, he's going to kill you. Next, angioplasty and stenting is not good in the carotids. And that's why we don't like to touch them that much because we don't have a good non-invasive procedure at this time. Everybody who's got carotid disease should be on a statin. The goal is to have an LDL of at least under 100. And even goal-directed therapy in lipids is not too clear anymore, but you should be on it. Remember that the posterior circulation means not the carotids. That means not the carotids. Vertebral basilar is not the carotids. Don't treat asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Thanks so much for joining me. Stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all palms. You shall possess the good of the earth and the sun. See you in the next section.